All right, David. Good afternoon, everyone. Apologies, David. I've just sent you a a little curveball there. Uh, always click the start webinar button. So we'll start again for the benefit of our listeners. Apologies if we've kept you waiting a couple of minutes, but uh, thank you for your comments, some of you. I hope you can all hear us now. So we're here to talk about investors relief, David. Good afternoon. No, I'm not, I'm not finished talking about investors relief. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I'm going home now. Bit of a bit uh, of a false start there. Apologies. Yes, we're talking about invest. In, we're talking about investors relief. Um, and uh, as I was saying, um, I was listening to the. Uh, radio in the car the other day and there was a piece about a, a, a lady who was um, explaining the difficulties that she'd had in bringing up uh, what I think used to be called a mixed race child but is now a, a child of dual heritage and um, investors relief is is, um, is somewhat similar I suppose in that it's it owes something to entrepreneurs relief it owes something to perhaps EIS relief, but it has um, some characteristics of its own that aren't common to either. Um, some might call it the, um, the bastard child of two Careful. unlovely unlovely parents. Well, you say it's unlovely. I think most of us regard entrepreneurs relief and EIS as, as two extraordinarily valuable tax breaks. Well, yes. OK, perhaps I'm being unkind. A little perhaps. Uh, but, uh, um, so. Uh, but I thought I thought we'd start by seeing um, what the relief this this new relief introduced by Finance Act 2016, introducing a whole bundle of sections um, after Section 169A V. So we've crammed in Section 169 VA to Section 169 VY. So now we're counting up probably about 50 sections now in the legislation between Section 169 and Section 170. So this relief introduced as Chapter 5 of Part 5 of um, TCGA 1992, Investors Relief. Um, some have called it, described it as Entrepreneurs Relief for Investors. Um, some have described it as um, you know, EIS Relief Light. It's not really either of those. It's like all children. It's it's, uh, it's its own character. Um, so I thought we'd start by saying what it has in common with each of its parents and how it's different from each of its OK, so let's start, David, by comparing it to entrepreneurs relief. Um, if you want to talk okay. us through this slide, I think it sort of highlights the point. There are similarities, strong similarities between both regimes. Yep, I mean, 10 percent tax rate, that's the most obvious um, characteristic, uh, 10 million pound lifetime limit. And that lifetime limit is a separate limit for uh, entrepreneurs relief and for investors relief. So in principle, um, you can get 10 million pounds on of entrepreneurs relief and 10 million of investors relief you can't however get them as far as i can see i don't there are any circumstances in which you get them on the same company because i don't think you can i don't think you can, you can satisfy the conditions for entrepreneurs relief and investors relief in the same company it's certainly not at the same time, the time yes um, i suppose in theory you could be an entrepreneur to start with and then but let's not go there um <laughs> se separate, on a postcard separate, that one. separate 10 million pound um, and indeed, if, if you have a spouse or civil partner, you can effectively double that up as well, potentially. So there's up to 40 million pounds worth of relief here mm. or gains of 40 million pounds. So it is extremely valuable, it would be fair to say. Uh, yes, it's it's uh, it, it, every little helps. Indeed. Say. Um, so 10 percent, 10 million pounds. That's those are its similarities uh, in entrepreneurs relief, of course, um, applies potentially to the disposal of businesses. Um, Assets used for the purposes of a business when the business is closed down. Yes. Um, shares, uh, securities. So entrepreneurs relief has this whole range of, of, of things that it can apply to. And just to reiterate the point you've made there, although it says assets on the slide, that has to be the disposal of assets as part of the disposal of a business. Well, or, not yeah, just or, the or, or cessation or after cessation of a business. Okay. Of course. Agreed. Yeah. But yeah. not uh, if you have an existing business and sell surplus property, for example, um, that wouldn't qualify. Uh, for no, entrepreneurs no, relief. Not, 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 not unless it were, as a matter of fact, disposed of part of a business, which generally it wouldn't be. Fine. Um, investors relief applies only to ordinary shares. And we'll talk more about what we mean by that a little bit later, perhaps. Yeah. Entre entrepreneurs relief, of course. The interesting, one of the interesting things about entrepreneurs relief is that although the qualifying condition is um, by reference to the holding of ordinary shares, uh, entrepreneurs relief, of course, can apply to disbursed gains on securities that don't themselves uh, aren't themselves necessary to give the qualifying status to the company. But investors relief is only on 
on the ordinary chairs. Okay. Not on, not on securities of any kind. Okay. So that, that's sort of the headlines. If we drill a bit deeper, what sort of shares can qualify for, well, for either of these reliefs? Well, entrepreneur's relief, um, any old shares will do. Mm. Yeah, any old shares will do. Um, shares or securities. Uh, new shares, subscribe for shares or second-hand shares, shares that are acquired um, from the original um, acquirer can, can, acquire, can, can get um, entrepreneur's relief. Investor's relief is only for subscribed for shares. And I think we probably talk at some later point about uh, what is meant by subscribed for. Yes, I think we do. So they are only new shares for um, investor's relief. Uh, entrepreneur's relief, um, the relief is available for quoted or unquoted shares in principle, though it's perhaps a little less likely that you would meet the qualifying conditions for quoted shares, but there's nothing in the yeah. legislation yeah. that stops entrepreneurs really yeah. applying for. And broadly, 5% we're talking about for these purposes. Yes, yes. Investors' relief um, they applies only to um, unlisted shares. Interestingly, the, the investors' relief legislation uses the term unlisted rather than unquoted, um, though there's very little practical difference okay. between the two. But just to clarify, for example, AIM listed shares, AIM listed shares are unlisted for um, our purposes. Correct. So, yeah. yeah, so pretty generous there. Yeah. And what sort of companies are we talking about that benefit from these reliefs? Well, this, this is a little bit odd um, because um, entrepreneurs' relief, the, the definition of uh, uh, entrepreneurs', entrepreneurs relief requires the company to be a trading company, of course. And that trading company is defined uh, in um, Section uh, 165A. Same rules as apply to holdover relief for um, gifts of shares, but there are these special rules that were introduced in uh, FA 2015 and amended in FA 2016 for partnership companies and joint venture companies. But, yeah. And when the the investors' relief legislation came out, I and I think a lot of people assumed that the same definition would apply. I mean, why wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't. That extension to those special rules for partnership and joint venture companies that the revenue thought were so important to introduce for entrepreneurs' relief simply don't appear in the investors' relief provisions. Um, and it's, it's no immediate logic for that, is there? Well, they forgot to copy that bit over. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know because so much of the so much of the investors' relief legislation is is as you as mm. you say a cut and paste job. I, why that bit wasn't cut and pasted, I have no idea. But you know. It wasn't. I, suspect, I wonder if investors' relief is aimed more, arguably smaller investors who don't have the same level of control that someone who may be able to obtain entrepreneurs' relief would have and may be able to manipulate the share structure accordingly. I think that perhaps was their concern, wasn't it, with these employee-controlled companies that people were putting in place to give yourself the requisite 5% shareholding. So I just wonder if they feel that people are entitled to investors' relief are less likely to well, seek to manipulate the structure. That's the only yes, thing I can I, think I, yeah, of. But, true. I mean, I'm not complaining. Mm, it just would make it life a little easier yes. if you had the same definition. Because, of course, the definition for EIS companies is different again, as we'll, as we'll see. So you've now got these three reliefs that are you know, broadly similar. No, actually not that similar, but they're, they're, they're targeted at um, investment in, in, um, in small companies uh, with different definitions. Okay. Anyway, so... All right. uh, no, what else have we got on entrepreneurs' relief? We, well, we've already talked about this first point. For entrepreneurs' relief, you need broadly 5% of the ordinary share capital that gives you 5% of the voting rights. And that's that's what opens the door. It has to be a personal company. Yes. Yes. Um, and for investors' relief, there is no minimum. Um, it doesn't. The, the concept of personal company doesn't um, figure in investors' relief. Mm-hmm. Um, next point there for, for entrepreneurs' relief, it must be an officer or employee of the company um, at the date of disposal. Um, uh, and for investors' relief, it's completely the other way around. You must not be an officer or employee. Nor so, yeah, anyone connected with you, I think, isn't it, David? Nor, nor, nor anybody who is uh, connected or associated. Um, we will um, look at that. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll look at the exact definition right, of who can so be. Broadly, can be it's not just it's not the just investor. you. It's, it's, any, it's anybody that you, you know, that you like. <laughs> um, and entrepreneurs' relief, there is no minimum holding period for the shares disposal of for ER. Uh, 
um, for, for entrepreneurs relief, for, in, sorry, for investors relief, the shares must be held for at least three years. And when now, you, sorry, when I say there's no minimum holding period for the shares disposed of, uh, there is, of course, a minimum period during which the company must have been your personal company and you've been an employee and those conditions are fulfilled. There's that minimum one year period Thank you. that the conditions need mm -hmm. to be fulfilled, but there is no specific requirement as to the period during which the actual shares are held. So if you have it for entrepreneur's relief, if um, I have ticked the box for the company being my qualifying company for a qualifying holding period of, of one year, then in principle, entrepreneur's relief can apply to shares that I've acquired five minutes before I disposed of them. And this we sometimes see in the context of husband and wife companies where, for example, one of the, the two of them has <clears throat> negligently forgotten to become an employee or a director or the assistant company se uh, uh, secretary, for example. If you yeah. switch those shares back to the qualifying spouse immediately before disposal, you have solved the problem subject to that other spouse having enough headroom in his 10 million pound lifetime limit Correct. to take yes. so yes. There, yes. there is something that can be done there yes. so so investors relief shares must be hard for at least three years with that necessarily therefore brings in the uh, requirement to identify out of a particular shareholding which ones you've held for three years we've made disposal yep. of the shares so you've got a whole, whole swathe of legislation that's required because that because of this requirement for the shares be held for three years, you necessarily have to have some rules to help you work out whether you've held shares for three years. Okay, understood. All right, um, let's move on if we may. Uh, still on the entrepreneur's relief and investor's relief. Um, for on entrepreneur's relief, there is this scope for associated disposals where you've got a disposal that qualifies for entrepreneur's relief. Uh, there are rules which allow certain other disposals to sort of piggyback upon the, the reliefs. So typically where you dispose of a shareholding in a company and you are also at the same time and as part of the withdrawal from participation in the company's business, mm -hmm. uh, you dispose perhaps of a property that is used by the company but owned directly by the shareholder. And then the, the, you've got this, this concept of, of associated disposal relief. Which again, it's been changed incidentally by Finance Act um, 2016. But there is no concept for um, investors' relief of associated disposals. The, 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 not only do you only get it on gains on ordinary shares, um, there's no there's no associated disposal relief that, 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 goes, that goes with it. So in that sense, the legislation for investors' relief is a bit simpler. Indeed. Um, however, however, entrepreneurs' relief um, there, I suppose if, if, if the, the, there's, there's no restriction in entrepreneurs' relief for any uh, receipt of value. There is in investors' relief, and that again is a consequence of the fact that you're only getting the relief in respect of shares that are subscribed for. If you're if you're targeting it on subscribed for shares, then you have to have some sort of um, mechanism uh, to deal with the possibility that having subscribed for the shares, you get something back. Indeed, and that's the point. Your money must really be at risk. In, 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 yeah. So they, they've um, in the the um, the chap who drafted the investors' relief legislation, having sort of raided the parts bin of entrepreneurs' relief, um, so to speak, for a lot of the legislation. You know, then nipped down the um, you know, nipped down to the next office and raided the parts bin for EIS relief, and and cut and pasted the receipt of value rules for um, EIS into the. Okay. Investors' relief legislation. I mean, the only other point I can add to that, yes, we get associated disposal relief for entrepreneurs' relief. That can be restricted if, for example, in your example, you had a property uh, being used by the company owned by the qualifying shareholder if he charges rent for the use of that property. Yes. So that's almost yes. akin to sort of receipt of value, isn't it? He's receiving something, but that's about as close yeah, as we yeah. get and sort of third cousin twice removed yeah. close, isn't it? Sort, but, sort of, but yeah, there so, you go. Yeah. So that's comparing entrepreneurs' relief to investors' relief. Uh, as we can see, some good, some bad, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now let's just have a look how it compares to EIS. But, but just at this point, I think it is already clear that to describe investors' relief as entrepreneurs' relief for investors is is a great oversimplification, yes. and it's 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 misleading, mm. and you could get into all sorts of trouble if you 
if you merely regard investors relief as entrepreneurs relief with entrepreneurs relief sort of tipex out um, other correcting fluids are available and um, and, and, and investors you know put it put in place okay um, just I'll interject for one second all very shy today our, our lovely listeners um, feel free to uh, type in your questions in time honored fashion and myself and David will will do our best to answer them so uh, do let us know if you've any queries on anything we cover today. You have switched the microphone, yes. Yes. Just, just, just checking, just checking. Um, so, yeah, so EIS, EIS, it's a, a compared and wondered whether you might possibly regard investors relief as a sort of EIS light, as a sort of version of EIS relief that doesn't have quite the same restrictions on it. And you can sort of see it, and it's got some similarities. Um, and we go through these here. Uh, EIS, the gains on the EIS shares are yeah, subject to various conditions and so on, are exempt. Uh, whereas investors relief merely gives you a 10% tax rate. So there's, there's the first um, difference between them. Uh, there are limits on, on both. Um, EIS is a limit on the amount invested, but in principle, there's no limit on the gain that can be exempted. Yeah. Um, IR is the other way around. Is that there's no limit on the amount you invest, but there is a limit on the gain. That's the 10 million limit we've talked about uh, on the um, amount of the gain that can qualify for this 10% uh, uh, tax rate. And it's, I suppose it's a little bit like, but not very, um, um, uh, pensions and um, ISAs. Yeah, okay. well, on the one you get you know, the relief going in, and the other you get yeah. the relief going in, but exempt. Well, it's, I, okay, it's not very much like pensions and ISAs, but it's not wholly. Right, let's move on to the next one, shall we? <laughs> um, ordinary shares with additional restrictions for EIS, um, for, in, for um, investors' relief, they merely have to be ordinary shares. Uh, there are no additional restrictions imposed upon uh, shares for. Okay. And we'll touch upon what we mean by ordinary shares when we, we delve a little bit deeper under under the bonnet shortly. So, EIS, though, we do need to be careful, although it is targeted at trading companies, only specific types of trade. Uh, and the list keeps getting a little bit broader as far as what trades are excluded. Uh, Investment-backed activities are typically excluded for these purposes, nursing homes... Uh, yeah, excluded. I mean, cynics would say that um, as soon as a trade gets too much money invested in it, it's um, the government knock it out as a qualifying trade. But harsh, 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 but probably true. Mm -hmm. and you're right; it is essentially um, asset-backed uh, trades that, that don't get EIS relief. But the point, the point is here that it's, it's they are not they're happy trading companies, but they also have to be carrying on a specific type of trade. Um, whereas for investors relief. It just has to be a trading company, and as we've said, it's it's even a broader definition of trading company than uh, even the entrepreneur's mm. relief. Or to be clear, the holding company of a trading group should probably add for these purposes. Should I should, be, should add that? Yes. Really. Yes. yes. Uh, okay. Any uh, geographic restrictions here, David? Uh, no, I don't think there are. Um, the same, as with entrepreneur's relief. Um, okay. EIS, we need to be a little bit careful. It has to have a UK permanent establishment, doesn't it? There has to be a it has to be a company in the group, I think. With a, I think it's just a UK permanent establishment with, these days. Yeah, yeah sorry, but yeah. it's a company within the group that needs to mm -hmm. appear rather than the holding company. Yeah. It's just somebody somewhere along the line uh, has to carry on. But, but I think it is, even then it's not the case that the money has to be used for the purposes of that UK Correct. permanent establishment. So bizarrely, you can get EIS relief on subscribing money that has no impact at all on the UK economy provided the group that you're investing mm. in happens to have some minor activity in the UK. And, and the revenue, they do look at that point quite closely, actually. A permanent establishment, I mean, we, there's a treaty definition, there's now a UK domestic definition that very much copies the OECD definition. But they're, what they're looking at is some real substance here in the UK, you know, a, a genuine sort of office and a presence here. Um, yes, I've seen some cases just, where the revenue, where it's been suggested rather optimistically that having a registered office and a director that turns up once in a blue moon is enough. But I think that's no, I think that the doesn't work. No, the revenue do look for a little bit more there. We do have a question mm. from Henry. Could you please clarify the current situation for ER as it applies the transfer of sole trading businesses to a new limited form for the sole trader for the per these purposes? 
So if we're tipping a business into a company, David, would we get entrepreneur's relief in those circumstances? Not. Do we want to cover that now? Should we see how we get on? We'll come back to that. We'll come back, we'll to, come that. back to that. Anyway. All right. Thank you, Henry. Uh, so we were looking so trading companies, EIS, restriction for certain types of trade. Have a look at section 192 of ITA if you want to have a look at exactly what those trades are. What sort of shares qualify, David? Um, what sort of shares qualify? Well, they need to be subscribed for shares in both in, cases. In both yeah. cases. Um, and uh, I think we've talked all in a minute about what I mean by subscribed. Um, a, there is a definition of um, subscribed for shares. Um, which we'll talk, which we'll talk okay. about in a moment. Um, and the receipt of value rules, because EIS, you know, because they're both subscribed for uh, shares, they have very similar uh, rules on, on receipt of value. Okay. So you can see there are sort of similarities. Okay. EIS, now next slide, EIS and investors relief. There's a three-year ownership period that's required. Um, it's very similar provisions as to employment. You mustn't be employed and neither must any uh, connected person be employed or a director of the uh, company, except for the yeah, so-called business angels, that is um, people who become directors of the um, company after the money has gone in and um, are, are, are un, unremunerated. Yes. Well, that's not a phrase you'll find in legislation anywhere, business angels, is it? It's just it's, what, it's what you and I always want everybody to understand. Them, exactly. Yeah. And we've talked about the next one. Well, a trading company has to carry on a specific type of trade. Um, what else have we got? Yes. EIS company, there the, the must be what the legislation calls unquoted and investors relief unlisted. There is a fine, um, there is a fine distinction between the two. It is possible to be one without the other. Um, but to be honest, um, it's um, such a fine distinction. I can't now remember how you were, how, what, what it is. But essentially, it's 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 in 99 percent of cases, it, it means the same thing. Okay. EIS must be connected, of course. They've got a limit on the shareholding you can have in the company. With investors' relief, for if you've got more than thirty percent, then um, you're connected for EIS and therefore yes. disqualified. You and your associates, indeed, for these purposes. Um, and investors' relief, there's no limit on the on the shareholding. In principle, in principle, um, you could, I suppose, in theory at least. Um, have investors relief on the whole of the share capital of the company, provided the other conditions were fulfilled. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you form your own company and acquire all of the equity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But since if you did that, you'd most likely want to be a director. You'd be better off with you'd be better off with entrepreneurs relief, which you know achieves the same thing. Exactly. So it's, it's, um, but the, 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 so I'm, I'm not by any means suggesting that that. That you know, investors' relief is something that you should you know, get, aim for, um, you know, in, in preference for entrepreneurs' relief. But anyway, but there is no limit on the on the shareholding. The IS company must be independent, must be under the control of another company, must be any arrangements to be under the control of another company. Um, investors' relief, there is no independence requirement in principle. You can get investors' relief in respect of an investment of shares in a subsidiary company. And that could be quite helpful, actually, couldn't it? Um, it so it's, it's a, a, another differentiation. Mm -hmm. And similarly, um, EIS companies are not allowed to control companies um, other than companies which meet the test of being qualifying subsidiaries. And the test for which is um, includes the um, requirement that nobody else has control of the company. And that there are no arrangements for there to be control of the company, but the, the, the investors really the company can um, can qualify, can control another company if it uh, wishes. I've got a question from John. So I was, I was squinting at it. If you're if you're sat comfortably, so John asks: Is it possible to invest in an EIS company? So take thirty percent. And after three years, so you've met all of the IS conditions, I assume, for the three years. After three years, buy another, say, 30% with a view to having 50% EIS exemption and 50% investors relief rate on the 
on my disposal. I assume it means 10% and 10% on both. No, uh, but, so, well, well, yes, but half of your shareholding yes. would have EIS exemption, mm -hmm. half of it would have um, investor's relief. I can't immediately see why that wouldn't be possible. Yes, sorry, yes, I misread that. So half of yeah. your shares would be exempt under EIS and the other half you bought you get 10% rate under investor's relief. No, I can't immediately see. But there's no um, there's no requirement that you're not a um, already an existing shareholder of the company in getting investor's relief. So the fact that you already have shares doesn't prevent you from claiming investor's relief in respect of a um, subsequent. Yeah, no, that would be my reaction as well. Yeah. So yes, yeah. potentially uh, again. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Very yeah. effective yeah. way of relieving your gains there. So thank you for that. So that's that's the overview. We've compared investors' relief to both EIS and entrepreneurs' relief, and we can see the similarities um, do between I think, both. Do I think we could qualify? This is coming questions coming thick and fast. They are. I now mean, they've woken up. Yeah. Do I think you could qualify for investors' relief in an acquisition vehicle company? Um, well. Depends what we mean by an acquisition vehicle company. If if the the if the company if the purpose of the if the company is to be the holding company of a trading group, then I see no reason why why you wouldn't, um, because it would then be a um, it would it would then be a, 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 a qualifying company. So I don't see why that would debar you from relief. Okay. Um, yeah, because it would be a, it would be the the, trade, the holding company of a trading group. All right, thank you for that, David. Okay, so that's the overview. What we're going to cover in the second half of this webinar is just drill down into a bit more of the detail here. So, over to you, David. Let's start by talking about the qualifying shares. Exactly what do we mean? Again, hopefully this is just expanding upon what we've talked about. But first point is they have to be subscribed. They have to be for. subscribed for shares, yes. And we've got a definition of, uh, of subscribed for shares. Nice long definition of subscribed for the purposes of this chapter. Person subscribes for a share in a company. If that person subscribes for the share, nice sort okay. of circular definition. Um, and the share is issued for a consideration consisting wholly of cash. So they've got to be subscribed for in cash. No, yeah. no subscription in kind. Yeah, it's got to be fully paid up at the time it's issued. So no uh, huge surprises so far, yeah. as it were. This is again very much mirrors sort of EIS, doesn't it? Uh, pretty much, pretty much. Um, shares got to be issued for genuine commercial reasons, and not as part of arrangements. The main purpose, or one of the main purposes of which, is to secure a tax advantage to any person. And that's quite interesting, actually. The word use. Um, if you compare that with the EIS legislation. Which at section 178, EIS talks about a tax avoidance purpose. Mm. Um, and tax advantage and tax mm. avoidance are not necessarily quite the same thing. Um, tax avoidance is, um, well, I guess we'd be all afternoon defining tax avoidance, but gen broadly speaking, tax avoidance is seeking to, uh, uh, to obtain a relief that um, Parliament probably, if they thought about it, didn't intend you to obtain. Tax advantage is probably wider than tax avoidance, and things can be done to obtain a tax advantage that probably aren't tax avoidance. So this is actually a tighter definition of um, of, of, um, of, of motive than um, than EIS applies. And I think, in fact, I think I'm right in saying that 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 was changed in the course of the um, of the uh, as went through Parliament from tax avoidance. To tax advantage. I think it, I think I'm right in saying that there was a deliberate change, uh, and the um, and the, and the chair has to be subscribed for and issued by way of a bargain at arm's length. So um, there the, the, are no um, you know, shenanigans mm. that involve you uh, subscribing for share capital in a company that's promoted by your your nephew or your niece, and you put extra money in that nobody in their right mind would have done. And it, it, this, it generally needs to be a commercial. Um, mm. a commercial transaction. It's an interesting definition that in, in EIS now we have the condition that any other shares you hold must be broadly subscriber shares. Mm. But it doesn't define there what it means by subscriber shares either. 
And that's something people do need to be careful of. If you want EIS and you're an existing shareholder, you'll only get if those original shares also uh, qualified for EIS or were subscriber shares. So mm. no, it's, it's, it's a difficult area. You would, and, and clearly subscriber shares doesn't simply mean shares you've subscribed for. Yes. I mean, otherwise it's that's a pointless mm. definition. Um, yes. Um, going on from um, the, uh, def de the definition of, of subscription, um, if um, if an individual subscribes for shares and then transfers to another individual as a lifetime transfer, um, and they were the, the two were living together as spouse or civil partners at the time of the transfer, then the transferee spouse is also treated as subscribing um, for the shares. So it's it's it's, it's a it's what you would expect. Though interestingly, yeah. they don't need to be married at the time the subscription is made. They just need to be married at the time the transfer is made. Okay. Um, so that's that's also the definition of uh, okay. subscribed for shares. Um, the um, it, uh, the original draft of the legislation required that the shares were held by an individual. Couldn't be held jointly, and they couldn't be held in trust. That, that was changed as the legislation went through, so it is now the case that shares can be held jointly and they can be held in trust. So if anybody was looking at this legislation on the basis of the original finance bill, there's a, a point to note that joint, jointly held shares are now um, okay. Good. Um, what else are we talking about? So we know what's, we now know what's subscribed for shares. They have to be issued on or after 17th of March 2016, which is the budget day, when uh, this Chancellor former Chancellor, indeed, indeed um, yes. announced this um, relief. And they're going to be held for three years minimum before disposal. But the, the, um, the, that three-year period effectively can only start to run on 6th of April 16. So if the shares were issued before 17th of March, they have to be held for three years plus the period up to 5th okay. of April. So just be careful. The unlikely event they're issued in that two-week window before... Uh, the 5th of April 16. Yeah. So unlisted shares we've talked about, yep. but they can become they can listed. can become listed, but uh, yeah. And then they need to be so-called ordinary shares, where again, yeah. we need to be a little bit careful. It be, uh, there's, there's no uh, special definition of ordinary share for this purpose, and therefore the usual definition of ordinary share that applies in section 9, 8, 9, 9-ish nine yeah. um, applies. So um, basically... Um, any share is an ordinary share unless it's a um, essentially a non-participating preference share. Correct. And we could talk about non-preference uh, shares with a, a nil. We could, nil couldn't percent, we? And, we? and what's more, we could take our pick of two decisions. Indeed, we could never be wrong. Yeah, indeed. Or alternatively, we can never be right. <laughs> um, yeah. So ordinary share. Um, yeah. So not can be called anything it likes. To yeah. be honest. But yeah. there you go. Pretty pretty broad definition. Yeah. Um, oh, James wants to know whether growth shares and ratchet shares qualify as ordinary shares. Yeah, well, they can do, certainly, um, under the ordinary definition yeah, of ordinary I think share. They, I think they must. Um, yeah, it's, the definition is any share capital of the company, however described, except those with um, a fixed right and no further right to participate or Indeed. Whereas somewhat, somewhat yeah. along those lines. And we're always nervous with growth shares and ratchet shares in the context of employment-related securities, but given we're talking about people who, at least at the time of subscription, not employees, etc., then perhaps we don't need to worry. Yeah. We might if they come on board later, I suspect. I no, possibly, possibly. So, uh, needs to be a trading company, or the, as you say, the parent company of a trading group, holding company of a trading group, throughout the ownership, throughout the ownership period, and that's an important point. Not just the three years, are you making Not yeah? just the last three years. Mm -hmm. um, of course, with entrepreneurs' relief, um, you can invest in a, you know, shares in a company that's an you know, a, a investment company for 200 years, um, convert it into a trading company for the last 12 months before sale, and Bob, your uncle, in principle, um, entrepreneurs' relief applies. You only look at that 12-month period. Mm -hmm. Not the case with, um, with uh, investors' relief. You look at the whole period of ownership, not even the three years that are required to you know, give you title to the relief. Interesting. Okay. So be careful there. And we said the uh, the, the investor, I'm not quite sure why I put this under qualifying shares, probably because it's, that's where the legislation puts it. <laughs> um, the investor and any connected person uh, mustn't be a, um, uh, a, 
an employee or an officer or an employee at any time in the in the ownership period. Okay, so be careful. So again, different from entrepreneur's relief, because if you put entrepreneur's relief, you're only looking at the last 12 month period. So if you haven't been an employee, mm -hmm. then you can appoint, get yourself appointed an employee or director for the last 12 months and bring yourself within entrepreneur's relief. But it doesn't work the other way around for okay. investor's relief. It doesn't, you can't. But there are these angel provisions that there we'll, are these, these we'll, angel provisions, we'll yes. cover very shortly. Yeah. Okay, now, trust, if I'm correct, David, I don't think trustees could, could claim under the the original drafting of this legislation, could they? They could not. They so could not. This was so a this is, this is a, uh, a late le change, a late arrival at the investors relief board, so to speak. Um, and the um, ten percent rate of capital gains tax, you've got to claim it. Um, uh, you, you actually do indeed have to claim entrepreneurs relief. I did come across somebody the other day who had forgotten to claim it. Um, Oops. On the on the mis misunderstanding that it was automatic. What's the time limit? Uh, first anniversary of 31st of January, following the year of assessment in which so, the disposal takes place. So same it's as the, ER. It's a 22 month. Yeah. Um, so no, again, no surprises there. Um, yes, um, can be claimed by um, individuals or certain trustees. Um, we have a slide about trustees. Oh yes, we've got a slide next about some trustees. Okay. So we'll, we'll come. We'll come back to trustees. Uh, the point to bear about trustees is that, as with entrepreneurs' relief, because that lifetime limit is shared between the individual and the uh, and the trustee, what's happening when the trustee claims relief um, is that the trustee is effectively. I was going to say borrowing, but it's not borrowing; it's stealing. Um, <laughs> part of the individual's life sharing. Living. Yes, sharing. Okay. And um, again, very much mirrors ER in that it, it sense. Does, it does, but there's a, there's a very odd sort of additional provision, um, which I'm intrigued to know um, why it applies. Um, perhaps we talk about it on. Do we talk about it? Yes, we talk about it under the next slide. So I'll I'll um, I'll leave that to the next slide. Okay. Um, the relief is pro if part of the holding is a qualifying shares and part isn't, then there's a pro rata relief, um, as you would expect. And reassuringly, uh, uh, well, so in order to establish whether what you've disposed of out of a holding are shares that qualify for investors' relief, you need to establish whether you've held them for twelve for three years or not. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have to need you have to have rules to identify the, yep. how long you've owned the shares, which means that every time you um, make a disposal that is not a disposal as a whole holding, you've got to work back and see what the history of the shares is. And th 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 there are rules, and they identify earlier disposals, and they always operate in the taxpayer's favour. This is the, 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 the nice point. Surely so, not. It's yes, it's remarkable. Not a, not a typo then, no. no it always operates in the taxpayer's favour. So, w shareholding in a company, um, in, in, in essence, there are three categories of, of share that you could have in a company. There are shares that are excluded from relief because, um, for whatever reason, uh, those shares um, will never qualify for investors' relief. Perhaps because you didn't pay them, subscribe for them for cash, or because they weren't arm's length, or whatever. But shares that w cannot qualify. Mm -hmm. There are shares that potentially qualify, but you haven't held them three years or not, three years yet. So they're potentially qualifying shares. Right. And there are shares that are qualifying shares. In other words, that meet all the conditions, and you've held them for three years. And when you um, um, then make a disposal out of the um, shareholding, you have to look back and see what earlier disposals you've made, and um, the earlier disposals, if there was no claim on the earlier disposal, then the earlier disposal is regarded as being primarily of excluded shares, okay. leaving your potentially qualifying and your qualifying shares in the in the um, portfolio. And if on the earlier disposal you did make a claim, then clearly that was a disposal of qualifying shares because by definition they were qualifying mm -hmm. shares because you claimed a relief on them. But the rules are set out in um, mind-numbing detail in the in the legislation. But the, the, the sort of helicopter view is that they operate in the, in the taxpayer's favour, which okay. is a good thing. 
good. And it's, I imagine, nine times out of ten, people buy shares and sell them all. So it's you, you, would, it's, you would have thought so. It's hopefully not yeah. something we're all going to have to look at too often. Yeah. Right, we we did jump ahead a little, didn't we? Apologies. Now let's let's just flag up how trustees fit into this new and wonderful regime. Yes. Well, uh, a, a disposal <coughs> by trustees can uh, qualify for relief under uh, Section 169 VH, if you're interested. Um, and um, the in order for the trustees to qualify for relief, there has to be at least one um, eligible um, beneficiary in respect of the disposal. And an individual is an eligible beneficiary if the eligible beneficiary has um, held an interest in possession in settled property that includes or consists of the holding of shares that are being disposed of, and that he's held that interest in possession throughout a period of three years ending with the disposal, and that in no time in that period has the individual with the, um, with the um, interest in possession um, being a relevant employee of the company. So. Right. So, but interestingly, yeah, it is, it is, it is quite interesting um, that the trustees, in principle, you can have a discretionary trust that holds shares in the company mm -hmm. um, for a number of years, but otherwise qualifies for all the conditions for relief. Um, a points out a, um, um, creates an interesting possession, so it creates an eligible beneficiary. Um, and that eligible beneficiary has an interest in possession in the shares. And that, provided that interest in possession lasts for three years, and provided that the eligible beneficiary isn't an employee of the company in that three-year period, then in principle the trustees can get the relief. So in other words, the trustees have, and that doesn't matter if the eligible beneficiary has been an employee of the company in a period before he was an eligible beneficiary. Right. So you've got discretionary trust. Um, you've got Fred, who's a director or employee of the company. Um, but the trust has invested in the company, it, it, would, it, it would in principle be possible for Fred to resign as an employee of director of the company. The trustees create an interest in possession for Fred um, after he ceased to be an employee, wait three years, and then, in theory at least, well, not in theory, in principle, the trustees would be eligible for um, relief under every Okay, relief. All, all rather complicated. Well, Do we, feel free to speak to Terry Jordan if you have any queries in this regard, I think is what we're saying. Yeah, Yes, yes, yes. So there's a very, there's a very interesting part that uh, that applies to investors' relief that doesn't apply to entre entrepreneurs' relief, because the fourth condition for this um, beneficiary to be an eligible beneficiary is is it's a bit odd. The, the, re the requirement is that the individual has, by the time of the claim, elected to be treated as an eligible beneficiary in respect of the disposal. And how do you think he elects to be treated as an eligible benefit and beneficiary? Uh, how does he? How does he elect? Who to whom does he oh, elect? Well, you'd assume you'd have to notify HMRC. But no, no, no. Actually, you don't. The individual elects to be treated as an eligible beneficiary in respect of a disposal if he tells the trustees, by whatever means, <laughs> that he wishes to be treated, and he can withdraw that election any time before the claim is made. And I have no idea what the point of that election is because yeah, sure. because he has to be a party to the claim anyway, mm -hmm. um, because you know, the as we said because the um, relief is is um, is using up part of his uh, of his lifetime limit. Um, so it, it's 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 you know, in the case of a disposal made by the trustees, the claim is made jointly by the trustees and the eligible beneficiary, but the eligible benefit so. The requirement for the eligible beneficiary to tap the trustees on the shoulder and said, you know what, I'd like to be treated as an eligible beneficiary. What's the point? Mm. But it's, it's, it's there in yeah. black, and black and white in the legislation. He's, he's not lying. I can it's, see it. So uh, there, we, there we go. So that's, okay. that's um, and if not all the interest in, in um, or not, if, if not all of the interest in possession beneficiaries who have an interest in the um, shares being disposed of are eligible beneficiaries, then there's a proportionate restriction of the relief. So you, you might have a shareholding where um, you've got you've got two um, interest in possession beneficiaries with each with an interest in possession in half of the trust fund. One of them might be an employee and one of them not. So there would then be a, a half half of the gain would be qualified for potentially qualify for investors' relief. No, all right. Because there would be, be an eligible beneficiary in respect of half of the half of the um, trust 
that. Okay, all, all rather complicated, to be honest, but, but there yep. you go. Such is our system of taxation of trusts. And permitted employees. This is really interesting, too. This is really uh, rather so exciting. Just to sort of preface this, I think, you know, we're familiar with the concept for EIS purposes. As you say, you can't be connected at the time you acquire your shares, but you can then come on board as a director and indeed be a paid director as long as your remuneration is is what the legislation describes as reasonable um, and the idea is you want to come on board to provide your expertise and protect your investment and that's that's fair enough yeah so that's for EIS how does it work under investors right. relief well you're not allowed to be a relevant employee and um, uh, and no person who's um, no person connected with you is, is allowed to be a relevant employee um, and um, anybody who's been a, an officer or employee of the not only the issuing company but any company connected with the issuing company um, is regarded as having been a relevant employee uh, at any time right so you mustn't be a relevant employee any time in the holding period mm -hmm. but there are two exclusions and one of the, the first exclusion is the um, the so-called angel exemption where um, a, a person can be an unremunerated director at, at, in, in the relevant period, provided that um, at no time before the relevant period um, had the person mentioned, the other person in question, been connected with the issuing company or involved in carrying on the, um, uh, the, the business. So if I, I invest and I'm in the, in the company, I've not previously had any involvement in the company, and after the investment, I become a, a unremunerated director. That's OK. Yeah. Okay. So um, and the other exclusion is one that is not that, that, that is, that is uh, unique to um, IR. It doesn't appear in the, um, the um, EIS rules. It's a very odd one. It says that if a person, so this is the second car back from being right. an employee in the relevant period. So normally you can't be an employee in the relevant period. First car out is when we talked about. Second car out is this one. If a person becomes an employee of the issuing company or a connected company in the at a time which is within the relevant period, but not within the first 180 days of the period. So you've got to wait 180 days after you've acquired the shares. Right. Yeah. And um, you mustn't at any time be a director of the issuing company. You can be an employee, but not a director. Right. And at the beginning of the relevant period, so when you acquired the shares, and I will read what the legislation says, there was no reasonable prospect that the person would become an employee within the relevant period. So this, what this is saying is that when you subscribe for the shares um, as an investor, um, you are not an employee. But at least six months later, at least more than 180 days later, you become an employee. But, you know, it's gosh. I didn't expect to become an employee. There was no reasonable prospect that I was going to become an employee when I acquired the shares. I just sort of happened, Gov. Gov, yes. Um, and I, I, and there is a definition of reasonable prospect. Do you want to know what the definition of reasonable prospect is? Leicester retaining the league? No? Uh, no, that's a distant fantasy. Okay. Um, there is a reasonable prospect of a thing if it is more likely than not. OK, which I suppose yeah, makes sense. So the difficulty I see here is if you do become an employee you know, after six months, uh, is persuading the revenue that there was no reasonable prospect of that happening you know, as little as six months earlier when you subscribe um, to the shares. So I'm not quite sure you know, where that relieving provision is going or mm. indeed where it's coming from. Um, you know, as I say, you can become you can become an employee um, at a time within the relevant period, but not within the first 180 days of the period, provided at the beginning of the period there was no reasonable prospect that you would become an employee, and you're not any time in the relevant period a director. Um, and then you can ignore it. But how often is that going to happen? Mm. Bit no, it's not and that's very special, helpful. That's special for investors. Really. Yeah, it's not even thankfully. picked up from AIS. Yes. It's never particularly helpful when the legislation is uh, somewhat subjective like that. Okie doke. So be careful there. The limits. I think we've we've pretty much yeah. covered this. There's as the slide says, ten million lifetime limit under for investors relief, and that is addition to your limit 
support entrepreneurs really up. Yeah. Um, and as we said before, spouses can can benefit as well, and you could yeah. effectively double up. Yeah. Um, shared with trustees, the point we yeah. covered. Yeah. And we also mentioned that in the finance bill, there was an amendment put through so that jointly held shares are now okay for these purposes. Yeah. Okay. So, Moving on. Let's talk about reorganisations then. Reorganisations we can deal with quite quickly, I think. Um, essentially, where you have a reorganisation of share capital, then, um, so we're talking about the, um, a, a reorganisation of a single company under Section 127, and a share for share exchange under for another company, putting a holding company above or something mm -hmm. like that, under Section 135, or a um, uh, reconstruction involving transfers across to a new company in exchange for shares. Um, under Section 136, all of those reorganisations, uh, they they all have the same um, characteristic that for capital gains tax purposes, the new shares are treated as being the same as the old shares. Correct, yeah. And very broadly, same thing applies to investors' relief. So um, if, for example, um, you um, were an employee of the original company, but you do a reorganisation and pass the shares to a new company of which you're not an employee, then that won't give you investors relief because everything looks back mm -hmm. to the period of ownership from the original shares. Um, so, and, and equally, yeah, if you subscribe for cash for the original shares, then you're regarded as having subscribed for cash for the shares in the in the, in the replacement company, even though, of course, you didn't. Yeah. Um, so, broadly, reorganizations do what you expect them to do. Yeah, I mean, for EIS purposes, it's very narrow, isn't it? When you put a holding company on top. Oh, yes. It yeah. has to be the only shares an issue are our old friends, subscriber shares, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. You need to figure out, is it a little bit broader? This is just if you're within, you know, the normal share for share exchange rules for CGT purposes, then you still should be okay. Broad, broadly speaking, if the CGT rules say that the um, transaction will be regarded as a single uh, yeah, deemed uh, a deemed no disposal, then uh, then the, the then investors really treat it in no, the same actually, way. If for EIS there's a separate clearance you have to ask for, isn't there? Uh, Section two four seven of ITA. Do you have to ask for bespoke clearance under this, That's or is it a just very good just question? That's a very good question. Um, no, there is no specific. There is no specific requirement for separate clearance. Of course, you may need clearance in order to satisfy yourself that the you know, section one two seven three five six you know, applies in the first place. Yeah. But there's no separate. Yes. I mean, we'd always required. belt and braces recommend you go for clearance in the normal manner anyhow. And I suppose this is additional reason to do so if you are yeah. looking to protect your investors' relief. And as with ER there's an option to disapply that no gain, no loss provision. Right. If it's the case that for whatever reason, the new shares wouldn't qualify for investors relief, but the old shares do, okay. then you can you can disapply this no gain, no loss deeming provision. Okie dokes. Now, always a sting in the tail, isn't there? There are circumstances in which uh, your relief uh, can walk off into the sunset. Talk about disqualifying events, David. Yes, these are... Um, Essentially, it's a receipt of value using yeah. the same rules as, as EIS. Given that you only get this relief for subscribed for shares, then the, you would expect there to be, and indeed there is, provision to um, remove your um, benefit if, um, if, if you get something back. Now, they are broadly speaking the same rules. These are now in Schedule 7ZB of um, TCGA 1992. Um, which I imagine is somewhere between Schedule 7 and Schedule 8, but exactly where, as anyone's <laughs> guess. Um, uh, and all that does, yeah, pretty much all that does, is uh, is pastes in the um, receipt of value rules from the Enterprise Investment Scheme. You ignore insignificant receipts of value, which is defined as less than £1,000 cumulatively. And interestingly, the receipt of value rules apply only within the four-year period uh, ending, sorry, on the third anniversary of, of, of issue. So you can get um, a receipt of value um, outside that period without losing your your potential for investors' relief. But it, it's it's sort of um, I'm sorry, I've, I've said there that, that you can rescue it by by giving the value back as soon as reasonably practicable, as you can with EIS relief, really, mm -hmm. if you've got a receipt of value, it kind of inadvertently, you can, you can rescue it. 
it, the, the disqualification doesn't sort of really work in the same way for investors relief as it does for EIS because with EIS when you get your income tax relief um, it's the re income tax relief is restricted to the extent that you've had um, yep. receipt of value whereas with with investors relief this this um, status as being a qualifying share with a 10% um, um, rate of tax you've either got it or you haven't and it's like being pregnant and you, you are you aren't uh, so a receipt of value in excess of the um, de minimis limit is simply um, disqualifies the share from that 10% tax rate. So it could easily be the case that a, that a relatively small re receipt of value, okay, it's got, to, it's got to be significant, it's got to be more than £1,000, but it could be the case that a relatively small receipt of value um, could um, remove from the shares a benefit, i.e. the benefit of a 10% tax rate, that is massively more than the value Indeed. that you've received from the company. So, so be, in other words, if you receive a thousand and a one pounds worth of value back from the company, then you that the, cost you ten percent additional tax. Exactly on yes. an unlimited amount. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's a it's a slightly something to be very careful of. Yeah. All right, brilliant. Let's just uh, summarise. Finally, then, who's going to want it? Um, well, I don't think anybody's going to want it um, in preference to entrepreneurs' relief. Um, Who's going to want it? Entrepreneurs believe wannabes, perhaps. Um, we've got too small a shareholding. You know, they, they, you know, you, it, it can't be your personal company. It can't, or um, so that's one one possibility. Of course, you can't then be an employee or a director. But you know, it's the only way in which you would get your 10% tax rate if you if it's not your personal company, um, or perhaps EIS wannabes, who um, are where the investment is in a non-qualifying trade, so you count the EIS relief, or yeah. you want preferential shares, i.e. shares that, that have preferential rights that you can't have for EIS, or you want too large a shareholding that will make you connected with the company and therefore disqualify you from EIS relief. Um, I think those are the categories of investor who, to whom the relief will be um, attractive. Intriguingly, somebody did suggest that... Um, Perhaps this was a softening up for the withdrawal altogether of EIS relief. Yeah, heard that mentioned. Um, so you'd have these two parallel-ish reliefs for investors' relief and entrepreneurs' relief. That may well be the case. We'll have to wait and see. If that does turn to be, able to be the case, it's a, bit un it's a bit unsatisfactory that they are so similar in name and certain, there is such an overlap between them, given that they are there are such significant differences between entrepreneurs' relief and investors' relief. Um, so that's who I think might want them. That um, I think brings us up to uh, the witching hour, doesn't it? It does indeed. So thank you all for your questions. Have we got time for one last question? It depends on whether I can answer it. Well, that. okay. Richard asks: Do the rules re relevant employees mean that as an unpaid director, I only have one chance to get investors' relief, and that would be on the subscriber shares and incorporation? As any later issue of shares, the unpaid director would have been connected with the issuing company. Yes, I think that is. I think. I think. Yeah, because you couldn't then fulfil. Person in the office of the company of the company regards me as employee. Yeah, I think that's the case because you couldn't you couldn't then fulfil the condition in section one six nine VW three that at no time before the relevant period had you been involved in carrying on the trade. Okay, well perhaps yeah. if you have any other thoughts, yeah. we can circulate yeah. that. When yeah. we we will yeah. be sending out these slides, so you've all got copies of them. Thank you for your participation in this free webinar at Hasten to Add. Free, David, unlike other yeah, unlike, unlike, yeah, certain, No yeah. names, no names. Yes. No, we can't mention names. Okay, yes. um, but it is a pleasure to have you on board. Um, thank you for your thank you, Richard. Um, please feel free. If you've got any suggestions for future webinars, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but for now, thank you very much. If there's anything else we can help you with. On a, and a Merry Christmas to all our listeners. Christmas, indeed. Ho, ho, ho. And, and we shall be back in the new year. Um, so we look forward to you joining us again.